So how is it that we define employees? How do we define who's an employee and who's an independent contractor? Well, as I, as I said, courts use a variety of legal tests. And a legal test in the law always is, involves an analysis of a number of factors. And we're gonna look at these factors, we're gonna ask certain questions, and the answer to those questions are gonna help us determine whether this person is an employee or an independent contractor. Now the problem is, there are numerous tests. And the tests differ by which agency or by which court, or by which state, and sometimes even by context. And the tests that we use may differ depending on all of those things. The IRS uses one test for questions involving the Internal Revenue Code. The National Labor Relations Board uses another test. The um, the Department of Labor, in enforcing the FLSA, uses yet another test. So there's a numerous test, and they can differ according to a number of factors, making it very difficult for you as employers. I'll tell you right now that the generic answer is always, yes, this person is an employee. That should be the default answer. Why? Because that's gonna solve all these problems of being unsure about the status. Because what happens is, is that if one agency determines that the workers are not independent contractors, but in fact employees, other agencies can use that same determination and therefore um, execute the same penalties as before. Now there are three main tests, however, that we're gonna focus on that are used to determine classification. And we'll start with the biggest one, the common law agency test. The common law agency test measures whether a person is a employee or not, in large part based on the notion of does the employer have the right to control the acts of the worker? And this right of control, right to control, forms the heart of the common law agency test. Now this common law test, the reason we call it the common law agency test, is it actually dates back to that master-servant relationship. Remember we said that the concept of respondeat superior said that if a worker was doing the business of the master, then the master was responsible for the acts of the worker, even those wrongful acts. The employer has to answer for the wrongful acts of the employee. And so the common law agency test was developed out of the idea of how do we determine whether a worker is acting in the interest of its employer or whether the worker is acting in her own interest. And so the common law agency test, although it's used now in a number of different contexts, it actually had its heart, had its origin in the idea of who, how do we determine vicarious liability, respondeat superior. So we look at a number of factors, and, and I had all these listed, but uh, I think I'll, I'll just post something online because there's about 14 different factors. But the one that's important is this right of control. That's gonna be the dominant consideration. And what it says is, does the employer have the right of control over the work of the employee? You can think of it in this way, that if I am, a, say I'm a, a retail store, and I hire a worker to come in and clean my floors at night. Now, if I bring that worker in and I say, look, I'm gonna provide you with the tools, 
and I'm going to provide you with the cleaning products and I'm going to stand here and I'm going to tell you which areas of the floor you should clean at what time and I'm going to reserve the right to go in and inspect those floors and tell you to do it again. Well, all of those issues look like control. And so in that situation, odds are that the worker is an employee. Now, if instead I hire a worker and I say, look, I want you to clean the floors sometime between close at 9 p.m. and our opening at 9 a.m. and I want to see the floors cleaned and you're going to have to supply your own goods and your own tools. And in fact, maybe go hire your own employees to come in and help you clean. Then that looks like independent contractor status. Now this is a very gray area, right? Like, because clearly even in the, the other, the second situation, well, I got a right to say, well, I need the floors clean. Well, does that mean that it rises to the level of employment? So this question of control is a gray area and oftentimes courts can look at the same set of facts and reach different answers. So this right of control test, as I said, was uh, originated out of this idea of when is an employer liable for the vicarious liability of, the, uh, of its employees, the acts of its employees, the tortious acts of its employees. But now, of course, it has expanded. And in fact, this is the test we use for the National Labor Relations Act. The NLRA requires courts to use the common law agency test. So in any dispute about union activity, union organizing, union representation, the NLRA says that in determining whether this person is an employee or an independent contractor, an employee who has the right to union organizing and union activity, or an independent contractor who doesn't have those rights, we use the common law agency test. That's the test that we're going to use. Now in this case, NLRB versus Friendly Cab Company involved a taxi company that hired its workers as independent contractors. And that's the way most taxis operate. Most times when you step into a taxi, the driver is not working for yellow cab, the driver is an independent contractor who just happens to be using the branding of yellow cab. Now in this case, a group of cab drivers brought a claim for uh, union organizing. They wanted to organize a union. And friendly cab company said, look, you can't organize a union because you're not employees. And they said, we are employees. And how do they determine that? Well, they got to go to a court and the court has to address this question of employee status. And it does so by looking at the common law agency test. Did the company have the right to exercise control over the driver? And in this case, the, the court sided with uh, the drivers, the drivers as represented by the National Labor Relations Board. Why? because it turns out that in their agreement, the independent contractor agreement, it specifically said that if a dispatcher sent a driver a notification to pick up a, a, a fare, they were required to pick up that fare. If they were the closest, if they were the closest taxi to where the, the fare was, then they were required to pick them up. And the court said, that looks a lot like control. There are other factors that indicate independent contractor status, but wow, you can make this worker pick up a affair that he or she may not want to pick up. Well, that looks like control and that looks like employee. So the right of control, and we're going to use this right of control actually in other statutes as well, in, in other tests, um, but when it comes to common law agency, it's the dominant factor. In our other test, it's just going to be a factor. Um, 
we've seen this a lot in uh, FedEx cases. And we'll talk more about FedEx cases. And these specifically are the FedEx ground cases or FedEx home cases, not the FedEx with the big planes, but the ones that deliver packages like UPS. FedEx home or FedEx ground is a, um, hires are traditionally hired its workers as its drivers, as independent contractors, not as employees. And there was a lot of litigation coming out of this relationship. And there were factors that seemed to indicate both employee status and independent contractor status. In this case, however, the court focused on the things that indicated control. For instance, the FedEx required its workers to wear FedEx uniforms and require them to follow FedEx grooming codes and in fact would give them a list of uh, a route map explaining how they were to drive their route that day. And in all of those cases, in all those situations, all looked to the court like control, even though there were factors that did not seem to be control. So um, for our purposes, for your purposes, know that the common law agency test is based on this notion of right of control.